hello everyone. Uh, let me at first thank you, Matthews, William, Allen, and Angels for uh, organizing this fantastic uh, workshop and providing this collaboration opportunity for us. Yeah, it is my pleasure to introduce the problem proposed by Finance, uh, Finance Canada. This is the modeling unknown crisis. And let's focus on the some question uh, motivated by COVID-19. How to prepare for the next crisis when we don't know what's the source of that? And how to introduce institutional and social factor into theoretical economic system? How to mathematically simulation the model? And based on that model, how to measure resilience and efficiency and how to determine the trade-off between, uh, between them. And uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, based on the crisis generally, uh, we know the crisis happen rarely and is not entirely random events, such as the COVID. It can be, for example, we know the credit forms precede crisis and they are not necessarily the result of the large shocks. Maybe some small shocks can make a crisis, but we know there are, uh, we will have that for a unforeseen, uncertain time and it costs a lot to fix it. And, uh, but that's obvious preparation and uh, for the, for or uh, response to the crisis require reallocation of resources. The question is how to incorporate social factor into macroeconomic model that it calls a complex system such as macroeconomic agent-based model that we use uh, to tackle this uh, problem and this question. And we look at that in two directions, uh, practical and epistemological. In the practical terms, we use uh, existing uh, macroeconomic agent-based model and analyzes uh, the, its response to different shock under different uh, policy regime that my colleague Severin will give you more information about this model. And uh... yeah, yeah. So uh, in the end, after some discussion, we decided that we wanted the uh, sort of practical or applied branch of this project to uh, use a macroeconomic ABM to do a bit of exploratory analysis to, to simulate some, some stylized conceivable crisis scenarios and possible policy responses to think a little bit about issues of uh, resilience against crises. How can we best prepare for possible future crises? Um, and we decided to make use of one of the macroeconomic agent-based models that have already been pro uh, proposed in the literature. And in particular, that was the macroeconomic ABM that has come out of the Catholic University of Milan, and Domenico Deligatti and co-authors. And this, uh, this framework has two key advantages for our purposes. The first being that it is as macroeconomic ABMs go, relatively simple, meaning it has fairly low entry costs so that everyone in the group could get uh, at least a general idea of how it works and make suggestions uh, as to what we might do with it and then also work with it uh, among those that, that contributed actively to the, to the practical uh, branch of the problem and the other Ad advantage is, is, is a very practical one, namely that I've worked a lot with this framework in the past. Um, so once more, this is the diagram that we've already seen a couple of times over the past three weeks, uh, which gives you an overview of the structure of this model. So this, this is uh, supposed to be a generic representation of a macroeconomic system, which consists of several sectors, which in turn, consist of individual agents. So for example, there's a household sector consisting of individual households who consume, who save, uh, who either go to work and earn labor income or earn profit income from owning firms and the bank. Uh, there's a firm sector, both a, a capital goods sector and a consumption goods sector where the firms, they hire workers, they, they borrow in order to produce and or to invest. 
Uh, there's, there's a very simple public sector that taxes and pays unemployment benefits. And all of these agents interact in various markets within this model. And the aggregate outcome of these interactions, meaning the individual amounts of consumption of labor supply and so forth are then aggregated in order to create macroeconomic outcomes in order to create the familiar macroeconomic time series. Um, and now I just want to give you a very quick overview of sort of the key features of this model. So the first is that this model has a pretty strong Keynesian flavor in the sense that it is chiefly demand driven such that for instance, uh, the amount that a firm wants to produce is, is largely determined by its expected demand. Uh, and, and, and then consequently also employment is largely, expect, uh, is largely determined by expected demand. However, there are some potential supply side constraints. So for instance, firms may be unable to obtain all of the financing that they require for what they want to do. Um, or indeed there, there may be that there are frictions present on the labor market such that they may not be able to obtain all of the labor input that they require. Um, agents behavioral rules are based on local and incomplete information and agents in their decision-making make rule uh, make, make use of heuristic rules, meaning that there's no optimization. So you might think of this rather as a sort of uh, behavioral macroeconomic model. Uh, there's a relatively prominent role for credit and banking in the sense that uh, firms will frequently require credit to carry out investment or even their production. And hence the behavior of the bank, whether or not it lends under which condition it lends, uh, may have a sizable impact on, on, on macroeconomic outcomes. Markets are based on relatively simple search and matching algorithms, which may lead to suboptimal outcomes. And two, uh, one important simplification of this model that might become important later is that it is stationary in the real dimension, meaning that there's no long-term growth. Um, however, the model does of its own accord without being shocked exogenously uh, produce moderate fluctuations in, in the macroeconomic time series. However, on top of this, uh, we introduced a range of different crises, exactly, uh, that may happen in the model. Uh, so these were the sorts of extensions we, we decided to make to the model. So we introduced the possibility of this economy being hit by a, a pandemic-like crisis, which uh, implies a shock to consumption uh, that both decreases the overall level of consumption demand that, that is distributed to the firms and also shifts consumption demand from some firms to other firms, both as a function of infection numbers which for simplicity, we <laughs> just took the infection numbers from Canada and we feed them into the model every time that there's a pandemic crisis. Uh, then there's also a, a simplified stylized natural disaster that can hit this economy, which basically means a concentrated shock to the capital stock of a subset of firms, uh, as well as the possibility of killing off a small number of, uh, of household agents in the model as well as possibly disrupting some supply chains between, for example, capital producers uh, and, 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 and consumption firms. And then finally, the third type of crisis is a credit crisis, which rather than being imposed fully exogenously, although it can be imposed exogenously if you want, uh, is now triggered endogenously, meaning uh, it, it, it triggers with a probability that is increasing in the bankruptcy rate in the firm sector. And if this crisis triggers, then essentially the bank changes its lending behavior such that it, uh, such that it perceives each of its borrowers as more risky than it previously did and subsequently provides less credit. Then in order to analyze how one might go about uh, combating this crisis, we introduced a range of possible policy measures. So we introduced two continuous regimes, meaning things that are in place continuously throughout the run, namely a, a, a universal basic income that is paid to every household agent in the model and a stylized macroprudential policy, whereby uh, the, in a sense, the maximum leverage that the bank is permitted to have varies counter cyclically. 
Um, and then we have basically, uh, and then we have a, a set of extraordinary or one-off policies that may trigger during a period of severe crisis. Um, and these are in, uh, and are then tempor temporarily limited. Huh? Uh, and these are basically a furlough scheme where, you know, the government pays the wages of workers that would otherwise be laid off. We have a short-term income support scheme, which is essentially a short-term UBI where a certain amount of money is paid to workers. Uh, uh, to households for, for some periods. Uh, then we have credit guarantees, which means that if, uh, if a firm is unable to obtain all of the credit that it wants from the bank uh, on the regular credit market, it instead receives a loan that is guaranteed by the government. And finally, there can be a debt relief scheme in which a share of all firm debt is quite simply scrapped and the government takes the loss. Uh, we use this model to explore two scenarios that my colleagues are going to present to you in a little bit. Um, the first is one where we want to do, we wanted to do a bit of a detailed examination of a single crisis. And for this, we took uh, the pandemic type scenario. However, this pandemic type scenario, the impact of it may or may not give rise to a subsequent financial crisis. And we're going to see in a second whether or not that happens. Um, and then we have another scenario in which essentially any of these crises that I just described can trigger with some probability in each simulation period. So it is a multi-crisis scenario that we then use in order to determine how different policy measures may uh, improve the resilience, the, the, the overall resilience of the system against such crises. And that was my part. So next we're gonna hear about the first scenario, which is a detailed examination of a single crisis. Thanks, Erin. Yeah, so I want to talk about um, how we use this model to simulate the impact of spe uh, specific crisis scenarios on, on an economy. And yeah, for, for this purpose, um, for the purpose of demonstration, we focus on um, the specific scenario where the population faces a pandemic type crisis like COVID at um, time equals zero in the plots. And um, this crisis might be followed, as Erin mentioned, by an endogenous credit crisis, which we have calibrated in a way that it triggers approximately 50% of the time. And so in that case, the bank will become more risk averse for um, two years or, or eight iterations of the model. Um, now, um, here we, we um, evaluate uh, over averages of uh, over the population by um, looking at mean plus standard deviation of several runs. And uh, on, in the plots on the horizontal axis, we have the, the time dimension and the vertical axis indicates the, percent of, uh, the percentage of difference compared to the baseline. So basically uh, we, we assume that the original ABM represents the normal state of the economy without crises. And um, again, the plots of the gray area indicates the mean plus minus standard deviation of the starting time of uh, the potential credit crises. Um, the dashed line represents the scenario where only a, a COVID shock appears and the solid one, um, the case where it is followed by a credit crisis. Now, looking at the plots um, in um, the uh, two um, diagrams on the top, in GDP and consumption, we can nicely see this recession um, followed by um, a recovery. Uh, and we can also see that um, a subsequent um, credit shock even amplifies this effect. So the, the, the recession is more severe and the recovery takes longer. In the consumption plot, we can um, particularly see this wave-like behavior, uh, which we uh, which comes from the pandemic, and we even have a small um, recovery between the two uh, waves. Um, looking at the bankruptcy on the bottom left, um, we can see that um, this um, is specifically amplified by in the case where both um, crises happen uh, um, sequentially. And uh, probably not surprisingly, um, unsurprisingly uh, for the government debt, um, it increases in both cases 
although much more um, in the case where two, the, the two crises uh, appear, um, as it's mainly driven by the high expenses due to unemployment insurance, while at the same time, lower income, um, lower tax income for the government. Uh, but um, on a positive note, it's reassuring that um, even without any policy, um, the, the model um, um, basically returns to a steady state, which is close to the state um, before the, the shocks. So uh, now moving on. Um, oh, Excuse sorry. Me, how, many years, yeah? how many years does that take? Hey, excuse me? How, how many, many years before it stabilizes? Without, without so, any policy, it's, uh, if you have the credit crisis, it's actually almost five years, four and a half-ish. Yeah, so the, the unit is uh, like iterations uh, in, the, in the horizontal axis and four iterations are one year. Um, yeah, so as everyone said, uh, about five years. Okay, um, so moving on to um, one of the um, policies we, we implemented, which is um, an income support. And if this policy triggers um, for a period of, for two periods, so half a year, the government will make a transfer payment to all household agents, which is very similar to uh, a policy adopted by the US during the COVID pandemic. And um, very importantly, um, we, we have to separate now the effect of the runs um, for, for those um, uh, runs which initially, so be, um, without the policy intervention, had only the pandemic crisis, which we um, have aggregated on the left, and those which had both crises uh, um, sequentially, and those are on the right. And uh, now we, the dashed line represents the runs with the go government intervention, so this hopefully improves the results. Um, and notably, uh, the income support um, already lowers the probability to fall into a subsequent credit crisis in the first place. So this is very nice. So before that, um, without government inter intervention, we had basically 49 credit crises which were triggered and now we have only 19 over 100 runs. And now looking at the GDP plots, um, notably the recession is smaller and also the recovery um, is, is faster, which is also very, very, um, very nice to see. Um, yeah, now I would um, like to move on to another uh, government intervention, namely the credit guarantee, which we implemented, where um, if this policy triggers for six periods, um, if a firm is unable to obtain a sufficiently large loan from the bank in the regular credit market, it, uh, its remaining credit demand is satisfied by a loan which is guaranteed by the government. And um, similarly to um, the impact uh, from the income support, we can again see um, um, the, the positive effect of this policy. Again, on the left, we have aggregated runs that did not have a credit crisis initially. And on the right, you can see those which, uh, which had both crises uh, sequentially. Um, again, um, I, I want to note that uh, the policy reduced also the frequency of credit crisis in general, in this case, even to 17%, which is even better than, um, than the income support. Um, now, uh, moving on to the, to the next slide, I would like to highlight a final um, um, finding, which is the effect of the credit guarantee on the bankruptcy rate. Um, for runs which initially had a credit crisis. And uh, what we can see here is uh, that the policy seems to completely erase this problem, which, which I found particularly um, impressive. Um, yeah, on the final note, um, I, want, I would like to remark that that's of course just a selection of uh, our results as we just finished the runs um, for this scenario uh, this morning. And so there, there might be many other interesting findings that simply didn't make it into the presentation yet. Yeah, so um, now I would like to pass on the torch to Lingxi, who will talk about another use case of our implementation. Thank you.
Okay, thanks, Fred. And uh, my section is to show how the model ran featuring the possible crisis mentioned before, along with various policy combinations. So I use this figure five as the simple one to direct how we can read this uh, figures. So we plot the distribution of post <laughs> output across 100 runs for each scenario as histograms and computing some moments. So we can focus on the tail and the screwness and the kurtosis of this distribution and get a quick understanding of our results. Well, I also only picked several uh, policy uh, experiments and also uh, a several examples to, uh, of the crisis scenario because of time of limitations. So these are some of our results, yeah? And this figure five illustrates the comparison between the baseline with no crisis and combined crisis scenario. We can see that the presence of the multiple crises leads to the emergence of a heavy tail of low GDP values as also demonstrated by the sizable change in the screenase and kurtosis. So the right, the, sorry, the, the yellow side of uh, um, captures when the multiple crises happen, what will shift the GDP on um, distribution. So now let's move on to the effect of continuous uh, policy on the multi-crisis scenario. So here we just provide one example of, the re of our result, it's a credit policy. So the credit policy here means counter cyclical leverage restrictions on banks. The leverage constraint is linked to the GDP level. In this way, the credit policy is endogenously triggered. So figure six here shows that in contrast to the baseline scenario, the credit policy does not appear to have a strong effect in the combined crisis sighting. It appears to slightly aid the recovery from serious crisis and very slightly reduces the screenings and kurtosis of the distribution while even leaving the volatility essentially unchanged. So we also uh, calibrated some uh, description statistics. Uh, I didn't show the table here, just want to make the slides uh, clear. So yeah, but I can see that the volatility of output is not essentially changed with the endogenous, the endogenized credit policy with a multiple crisis scenario here. So now let's uh, move on to the example of one of policies. So figure seven shows how the combination of only two one of policies here. One is job retention and the other one is the government guarantees. And uh, this combination affects the, certainly the campaign crisis case, but this uh, to, and I want to, I want to, I need to say that the, the solution is that the two policies are to trigger automatically when the Christ hits and subsequently lasts for six quarters. So it's just uh, one and a half year. And for example, the job retention uh, means that for six post-crisis periods, the government will pay the wages of workers who would otherwise be fired. So that's how the policy will work. And uh, I also uh, check some materials these policies have already um, been implemented in the practical and uh, the Canadian government introduced the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy beginning March 15th and uh, also the Business Credit Availability Program has confirmed uh, a, a bunch of the loan value of almost 300 uh, million dollars and by and this has been done by July 3rd so we I show I, I picked this result to show uh, to show this and also, uh, and also yeah and the credit uh, really the debt relief has already uh, been done but uh, I think this results has some interesting things we can see then and the, the results in figure seven show that the 
the policy mix is indeed quite effective at reducing the weight of the lower tail at the, at the left side. And uh, the rest of the distribution has a quite similar shape to the one without policy. So if we just uh, combine the results of figure six and figure seven. So we can hence see that in our model, where our continuous policy regimes fail to provide resilience against the effects of serious crisis of the sort we impose on the model, in order to stabilize the economy under such circumstances, extraordinary temporary measures are needed and they are effective. And so let's uh, move on to the next slides and uh, we can, I, I will show you what's the interesting of this, uh, interesting point of this combined uh, two policies. So now the, so these policies do not lead to an increase in gas reason is this policy speed up the recovery and the shorter time in the recession increases tax revenues and reduces unemployment benefit payments. However, if the, if the one of policies like the income uh, support and the debt relief, such, such if I do the experiment of the mix of these two policies, this, they require the government to issue much more debt. This situation could be reversed, but with these two tap, this does not cost such amount of the government debt, and this can be canceled off and even be, uh, and, and, even, and there is even a decrease in the government debt because we just speed up the recovery. So the interesting point is here. And our results, uh, and uh, so uh, this, uh, I cannot show the, because there are also other uh, graphs about the mix of the, uh, the combination of the other two, uh, one of policies like the income support and the debt relief I cannot provide here because I have limitation. And so now let's move to the next section. Mark will present the, the first section of the MC, the, the epistemological project, yeah. Thanks, Lingxi. So one of the things that um, uh, was important when we were talking about these projects was, um, can everyone see and hear me? Just double check. Good. Um, was that um, in thinking about how to even understand resiliency and how to think in terms of unknown crises, we also adopted uh, a lot of discussion around sort of methodological questions and even just how do we conceive of crises. Um, and so what I wanted to talk about for the moment was to um, sort of step back from the CATS model in particular um, and think about where some maybe methodological or, or modeling based limitations uh, that we have. So to sort of summarize the approach we've taken methodologically is that we took an existing macroeconomic model and we applied an, uh, exogenous shocks to it. Um, and then we understand, uh, Jimmy tried to analyze how does the system respond under different policy regimes. So in a way, we kind of uh, used it as a little stress testing uh, system or, or, or um, forecast, not forecasting, but to, to understand how the system responds. Um, but with this methodology and the particular modeling approach we took, there's at least a couple of limitations that we, I wanted to highlight right now. Um, the first one is that um, we, we've treated um, both pandemics and natural disasters as exogenous shocks. Um, and the fact that the economic and ecological systems are so highly coupled actually means that these are, are not truly exogenous. And I'll say more about that on the next slide, but for the moment, um, also the fact that our agent's behavior um, only responds to purely macroeconomic variables. And so the sort of social behavioral changes that you expect to see uh, in times of crises don't really uh, have a role in the model. So on the ecological front, um, one thing which is, I guess, eminently true is that the economy imposes itself upon the natural environment. And the two ways that are the most important is that economic activities drive uh, changes in land use patterns, and they also drive changes in, the, in the, the climate on the whole. And these are connected to two pretty fundamental parts of our, the functioning of the global system, mainly our food and our energy. Um, and I'm sure people have seen lots of great graphs of how much uh, atmospheric CO2 concentrations have increased since industrialization, but people are maybe less familiar about how land use changes have uh, gone. So here's some data here on the left, which shows that since the onset of industrialization, 
uh, the number, uh, the amount of the world's uh, land that's being used for agricultural purposes, which is one of the leading sources of land use change, has nearly quintupled, um, which is which is quite quite a big change. Um, this is important, though, because um, the environment also impinges upon the economy, in the sense that um, these changes in land use patterns and the encroachment upon natural environments create more and more interfaces for interactions between humans, um, our domesticated animals, and also wildlife uh, who you know, live in the wild. Um, and these interfaces um, create exactly the sort of um, risk, uh, risk sources for the transmission of zoonotic diseases. And of course, that's a, a thing we're living through right now. Uh, and of course, we're also familiar with the, the large discourse around climate change that uh, changing climate, in fact, increases the risk of natural disasters. And so ecological crises are not exogenous to the economic system. And uh, building in such a model is certainly beyond the scope of this week, but um, we think it's important to sort of keep those things in mind because we often are limited by the type of policies we consider, by the type of models we build. And so uh, systematically neglecting that factor in a model when thinking about crises is a, is a big oversight. Secondly, there's a few phenomena around the behavior of agents within the model that we really couldn't capture that we expect could be um, worth thinking about in the context of resiliency to, against crises. And the first is that agents in this model don't really forecast in, in much of a way. Um, and that has a big impact on things like uh, moral hazard and policy uh, and, and incentive effects of different policy. And that's something which we can't capture. So the fact that the, they, that you know, all agents in the model know that a credit guarantee from the government will exist in times of crises could affect the way they decide to take on <clears throat> debt during non-crisis times, sorry. <clears throat> um, and secondly, um, we, we've sort of taken the role of the, um, the policy maker in the sense that we get to decide what policies happen during the crises, but that's not a guarantee. Um, the exact policies that are implemented at any given time are a result of the political process which governs uh, how these countries work. And so um, that's an important dynamic here. We could try to engineer the best policies, but if we don't understand how the social dynamics behind politics affect whether these crises will happen when they're needed, or sorry, when these policies will happen when needed, um, it's an important feature to understand um, uh, resilience of an economic and social system. And also um, questions about how um, policies are adhered to during the crisis. This is something which maybe has come to the fore during COVID because a lot of uh, the measures that countries have adopted to reduce the spread have relied upon voluntary collaboration or agreement. Um, and so there's um, an important sort of social dynamic that again is missing. And the nice thing is that once you're already working in the world of macroeconomic ABMs, there actually exists sort of modeling frameworks that you can start to introduce to look at how these phenomena behave, which were outside of the scope we had, but I'll point them out, is that they're essentially based off of um, game theoretic dynamics of how opinion or behavioral states will change amongst the agents. Um, and the sort of typical idea is that you add, uh, it's called multiplex modeling maybe, and that one layer of your model looks at the economic system and then another layer looks at how um, uh, the social dynamics are changing. And essentially each agent um, is endowed with a set of behavioral states. And these behavioral states influence the economic layer, but they're also influenced by it. So the, what, what the behavioral states amongst the range prescribed in the model that the agent adopts depends on the utility they gain from those positions, and that utility has a social aspect, um, but also an economic one. And what's great is that you can already sort of build these into macroeconomic ABMs. Um, I've had experience doing this with infectious disease models over the last year, um, but once you're in an agent-based approach, it's easy to sort of, sort of additionally add on some of these uh, features. And so with that, that's the end of what I wanted to say, and I'll pass it on to Timothy. Thanks, Mark. So where Mark is looking at the epistemological problem in terms of how we can adapt current models and modeling uh, concepts in order to address uh, these problems, I want to take an even more uh, 50,000 foot approach to looking at the nature of the models that we're looking at, the methods that we're using, and kind of the theoretical implications of that for questions of resilience, the unknown, and um, more, more questions like that. So one of the things that we've talked about a lot is that the, the nature of what is unknown and the question of crisis itself is defined by the modeling choices that we make. Um, but another actively uh, active discussion that we've had is that the future is, is uncertain. There's this sense of uncertainty to, the, to what's going to happen, but we tend to ignore the fact that it's actively under construction. The choices that we make in terms of policy and in terms of the, the theorizing that we do, even in spaces like this, in workshops like this one, uh, have an impact in terms of the construction 
of what is going to come. Um, and I think that these discussions have led us to a different kind of conception of resilience, especially in economic spaces. I remember when we were first having a conversation about resilience uh, at the beginning of this workshop and um, trying to look at this notion of, of resilience and efficiency trade-offs, which is, to be fair, unknown to me at the beginning of this workshop from coming from a different discipline. Um, and a person explained it to me in terms of health insurance for, for a healthy individual uh, who's, who's young, uh, like many of our participants, it may not be efficient to have health insurance because we're probably not going to use it. But I think for many of the individuals in this workshop who live in countries where there's universal health care or uh, things like that, we can acknowledge that there are severe benefits to having uh, health care policies that make individuals healthier, uh, healthier people rather than working uh, in a different kind of framework. So in a way, resilience is more than just a cost or an oppositional force to efficiency. We can rethink of, uh, we can rethink of how we understand the question of resilience. Another question that we've had was the relationship between social worlds, institutional and social factors, and their relationship to economic outcomes. Um, and of course, any model is limited in its understanding of the social dynamics of the world around us. But the real implications of this uh, go beyond some of the questions of uncertainty and they impact our policymaking framework, right? They impact not only the way that we understand how policymaking shapes macroeconomic and other economic uh, phenomena, but it also limits the uh, possibilities that we imagine for creating new policy. So as we move on to the next slide, we we'll kind of outline a new way of reconstituting and rethinking method and theory um, and some of the ideas that we produced over the course of this workshop. First is this question of reconstituting the unknown. If we eschew this sense of prediction uh, and, and instead embrace this concept of creation, uh, optimality for humility, we get this sense of how the work that we do can actively construct a different kind of economic world. And that sounds kind of Pollyanna-ish uh, as I'm saying it, but there are real benefits to attempting to understand the relationship between the social and institutional worlds that we build and the theorizing that we do. Additionally, when it comes to the question of resilience, some of the, re uh, some of the results that Lindsay, Frederick, and Severin have talked about uh, identify this really interesting relationship between resilience and um, the kind of one-off policies that we have. Um, and I think that this gives rise to a, a conversation that we've been having previously about a willingness uh, to a respond in the case of crisis. In a lot of ways, I think we, we've talked about the question of resilience by intervention versus resilience by design. And one of the things that has come out of our conversations and the results of this is that in some ways, the, the willingness and the responsibility to intervene perhaps in new uh, and revolutionary ways, rather than attempting to reuse the policies of the old or limiting our policy imaginary to the existing frameworks. Um, it reminds me of a conversation we've had previously with Alan uh, Kerman, who said, are we stuck with what we've got? And I think that the, the answer is no, we don't have to be. Um, and I think that that's what resilience can be for economic thought. And finally, for the social, the most important implication here is understanding the relationship between the theory that we have and the enacted realities. And uh, just to throw in a little bit of postmodern thought at the end here, um, when, we, when we get to the question of how our work interacts with the world that we are, are creating, it is important for us to embrace kind of qualitative projects. And these are, these are not to say that the, the modeling and the work that, uh, that has been done by other groups and, and certainly within our own project is unimportant, but we can also embrace a different kind of understanding of exploring the relationship between the social and the economic uh, that would be really important. And next uh, we'll have uh, Thomas, who's going to talk about kind of bringing this together in terms of the synthesis of our uh, two projects here. Thanks, Timothy. Um, so I'm going to talk specifically about ABMs uh, in the context of policymaking. So ABMs can be very useful for governments to use because they enable them to, to implement preemptive measures as models try to forecast shocks and responses to crisis. They can also enable them to compare different policies. So as we said, consistent set of assumptions and just change the measures that we implement. So we can isolate the effects of each policy. Um, however, there are barriers that prevent policymakers from using those I think the biggest one would be the disconnect between modelers and policymakers. Um, the latter may not fully understand how the math or the code behind it works, which may prevent buy-in. 
Also, um, underlying conditions can be subject to political agendas, especially this is a problem when models are very sensitive to those underlying um, assumptions. Um, politicians might not have an incentive to look at a long term crisis. Um, they might be focused on the short term and um, not look further ahead. And then finally, um, there's the difficulty of modeling hypothetical policies, which have never been implemented before. And we don't know what the social and behavioral dynamics of these are. So we can see that um, in the COVID crisis, for example. So um, in light of these limitations, um, I think it should be important to remember that uh, when we present these models to policymakers, we need to be very clear about the assumptions that are made to make sure that um, decision makers uh, buy into that and accept these assumptions, um, but uh, see the value in them. Um, we should also focus on specific problems and avoid an all-purpose model to answer specific questions. Um, and then we would suggest to use uh, decision theory methods to assess policy effects without subjective judgments about the assumptions. Um, so when policymakers are making those decisions, they need to ask themselves what kind of trade-off they are willing to make between efficiency and resiliency. And that's what Daniel will uh, talk to us about next. Great. Thank you, Thomas. Um, so I want to say just a little bit about the way we conceptualize these uh, notions of efficiency and resilience in our project. So when we thought about efficiency, we thought about the average case. You know, what is the most likely outcome and how well does our system do in, in this case? Um, and this is in some sense dictated by what we expect to see, what we've experienced before. But resiliency is very different heuristic. It says, it says that we should design our system for the worst of all cases. It's the idea that the tail of the distribution on the sort of poor end is really dictating the decisions that we make. And this is not a new idea to economists because it's captured a little bit in this idea of risk aversion, where if you're sufficiently risk averse, as long as there's a non-zero probability of a very poor event happening, you design, you make choices in a way that accounts for this possibility and that sort of hedges against it. So our notion of resiliency in this sort of worst case uh, con concept is really the extreme case of risk aversion. Um, so in trying to answer the, the question, how can we prepare for the next crisis, um, if we want an emphasis on resilience, it's really our responsibility to take off the hat of an economist and put on the hat of an engineer. Because engineers have been doing this for years. When they design airplanes, when they design skyscrapers, buildings, there is much more of an emphasis on sort of ensuring that in the worst possible case, if one of my engines fails, if the wind is three times what it has been before, that my uh, system is still stable. Right, so in a sense that, that the, there are two heuristics that go into this. The first is an emphasis on the worst case scenario. And the second is abstracting away from what we've seen before in dictating what the worst case scenario in the future could be. Um, so th thank you for this. And, and now I'll hand it over to Kincaid to close out, close out the presentation. Thanks, Daniel. So if our models are something like flashlights that give us a, a small degree of illumination in the dark and uncertain field, of navigating the future. We've seen in this previous part of the presentation that using our models to directly predict crises can shine some lights on the best possible responses. But this light, as our epistemological problem is illuminated, is itself pretty dim, and the flashlight might exist in some kind of parallel universe of the simplified and generic model, which makes it difficult to uh, translate the findings from the model into reality. And so in this final part of the presentation, I want to tie some of our ideas together in the context of some new powerful techniques from the field of deep learning, which might enable a new type of model that can overcome many of the necessary simplifications of previous agent-based models. And these two techniques are one speed and two automatic tuning. Uh, Facebook's engineers and Google's engineers have poured billions of dollars into making their predictions of social network graphs extraordinarily fast and efficient. And also deep learning has developed powerful techniques for tuning models automatically. You can give it a whole bunch of parameters to model complex behavior, even with rules that we don't fully understand ourselves. And as long as you have enough data, the models are capable of finding the best parameters to fit themselves. So moving into this next part, I want to uh, illuminate the goals 
of this subgroup of our project, which is focused on adapting the framework of deep learning-based, agent-based models into the CATS economic model. And our thousand foot motivation here is to build a framework that can easily be extended, uh, as perhaps Mark mentioned, with models from other disciplines, multiplex modeling type approaches that can help implement some of these innovations of our theoretical I guess on a, on a more practical level, the reason that uh, standard economic models largely failed to foresee, say, the 2008 financial crisis is that they were modeling these simplified generic economies. Their flashlights were uh, existing in this different plane of reality. When in fact, the crises are probably caused from the particular new devilish details of the individual economies. And the deep ABM framework might give us a way to apply these powerful parameter fitting techniques to model the particular in a way that simply isn't possible with previous agent-based models. So into our conclusions, this group has thought a lot about how we can answer questions about unknown crises how we can expect the unexpected and prepare for the unpredictable. We found that implementing crises as exogenous shocks in the simple agent-based model can help us design policies to counter them and measure the performance of these policies. However, our theoretical group has also uh, thought about ways that keeping these shocks as exogenous is limiting our imagination. In some ways, we could say just as uh, we build our tools and therefore the tools shape us, as Mumford said, we shape our models thereafter, the models shape us. This means that if we design models, the models may thereafter limit our imagination. And so we've tried to think about how can we avoid this? How can we understand when to use models and when not to use models? This group has some next steps. Uh, three weeks is a brief span of time, and so many of these questions we have begun to answer, we would like to formalize and continue to pursue. Our, epistemolo our epistemological group would like to continue uh, formalizing its ideas, maybe moving towards some sort of publication on the discussions we've had on the efficiency resiliency trade-offs, and the limits of modeling, when to transcend modeling. In addition, we look to continue improving existing ABM frameworks, giving our agents more foresight, and particularly, we'll continue implementing the Deep Cats framework to uh, bring in these tools from deep learning to try to make more hyper-specific models that are better able to illuminate the next directions in our future. And I want to as this final step, thank the many people involved in this workshop. It's been a brilliant experience uh, and a real joy to be a part of. So thank you to everyone. Thank you, uh, Kincaid, and, uh, and for group four, uh, like I did for the other groups, I'd like to start by getting a reaction from uh, Claude Lavoie, who proposed the problem uh, on behalf of Finance Canada. So, uh, Claude? Yeah. yeah, thanks, Matthias. I think uh, just to echo in the BAKK and also Ian in the beginning, I think I was uh, I totally impressed with the, the work in the discussion, the depth and the breadth of the Kindle's three week was. Uh, it was, you know, really, uh, really fun. And, uh, you know, I was not in, has been involved as much as I wanted to because we were doing a budget process, but I can tell you that every time I had a chance, it was a bit of a fresh air, a bit of fresh air to go and have a intellectual discussion relative to what I was having, you know, in my day to day, closing the, closing the budget in the last few days before we published. Um, I, I, um, I want to, in terms of the, the, the ABM, I'm going to have a few comments here. I mean, in terms of the ABM model, I, I really believe that's one of the way to go uh, to, because I think our, our macro models are broken. I think we need to include some bounded rationality. We have to uh, 
uh, including this the like, issue of anti-social interaction within our framework. And I think we actually, we, in a budget clause, we push a lot of stuff we call quality of life. And that's pretty much the idea. I think that, you know, things, there's a lot of synergy and interaction that we're seeing maybe to, to account when we do policy. And so uh, I think ABM model is probably the way to go just to reflect on, on, on what Mark said also, that all those things can be incorporated. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's, that's the thing. The limitation to it, to, to get back a bit of to the point of what we discussed at the end is, is that um, they, they often difficult to interpret and that we need to, to move with this in, in the fact that we, uh, it's like try to, to, the machine with a bit like, you know, I think he was referring to sometimes the answer we will, the machine will know you won't so what it come from that answer. And that's difficult to convince a policymaker to move forward with a, a bit like, you know, following Google on a map. Uh, and, and you don't know why it tell, tell you tell you that road, you just follow it. And, you know, we do it now more and more, but we should think you can get policymaker to there. It's difficult. That's why I think we need to work with EBM, but also I try to make them more intuitive. And, and that's obviously not obvious. Um, in terms of the efficiency and, and resilience period, I think that's something I'm, I'm bringing all this discussion that we had, but then I've got straight in the presentation because to listen in the, and then after uh, uh, to, to home and I'm going to brief them, you know, and, and pursue because that's something that we need to deal over the next, you know, years or months. You know, you can see the budget is, is planning to set the EI reform. Well, EI reform could have a really, really generous EI and having really resilient economy, for example, uh, but there's a cost to it, like, you know, the incentive that's great, there's a kind of cost to it, and to which extent we're willing to pay for this. Um, same thing for, like, you know, on the fraud economy statement, the government announced a plan to move with disaster insurance uh, while an earthquake, and, and again, you know, we, we will have a really good system of insurance, but there's a, there's a cost to it also. Um, and same thing with supply chain, you know, there's a more and more debate about, you know, how we should having supply emergency and maybe reshoring the manufacturing, but they, again, the efficiency costs and, and how much we're willing to pay for that. So this is something we, we're facing uh, every day. And obviously now after a pandemic, people may be more on the, uh, because we all exhibition, we put all the high priority on, on the last thing uh, that we want to be really protected, but, you know, we would still need to think a bit more like outside the, the box. I think that's what is really interesting. Uh, it's a bit, the, a bit of the engineering, uh, I guess uh, idea that was that was raised also in presentation. It's like you no, know, yes, we could have plane that never crash, maybe or the car that never get an accident, but the, the price of it would be really expensive, and whether people can afford it is a different issue. Um, so anyway, I just think that I, I think that's that was uh, tremendously fun. One question I have because I have the floor on this model. Let you see uh, the issue that the. Uh, when you intervene, it's pretty interesting to find the model go back by itself to equilibrium even without police intervention. The fact that you reduce uh, the the cut, the, 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 the downturn, uh, but at a cost, obviously, uh, typically you should get out of that. And, and this credit stream must, like we see right now, like, you know, if we have guaranteed debt for everybody, but everybody is taking more debt. And whether this is make, uh, maybe help this crisis, but make us more sustainable to a future crisis. And I think the issue of the debt of the government not increasing March is a, it's a calibration issue. I mean, anyway, you know, this is the thing we can talk about, but it's, it's all dependent on the calibration. But typically, you know, you have, you're getting more debt and if you get credit chain guarantee as well, which is, you know, a really interesting point, uh, but whether then you just encourage households to get more debt and whether it's making more sensible to the next crisis, but that's, that's something that we need to reach. Anyway, all that and three things, it, it's it's a really interesting topic. And obviously the question is really broad. So understanding we're not like precise, but you guys, you know, brought a lot of uh, fresh idea and new things in, in those topics. So that's for that, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, before, before I open to, to the general questions, I wanted to get a reaction of a few people. So starting from uh, Angus. Who Ma uh, Matthews, uh, can I oh, say sorry, a few Igor, words? Igor, yes. Yeah, because I have a call at once. So, okay, fine. Uh, yeah, Perfectly. I, uh, I just like to comment on resilience and efficiency. Uh, I think the framing is great, and I really clearly see this model can be used um, to really do more research along these lines. So, um, 
I uh, definitely uh, it's great work. Um, I would love to continue with students who really, we need to work a little bit more on defining better resilience and efficiency as the metrics and try to get to the trade-offs. I don't think it was well defined yet here, but there is significant potential. And that's the minor things. Um, I saw in a couple of slides, resilience pelvis Y on the end. Uh, I think technically speaking, uh, it should be E. Uh, colloquially, you can use Y, but I guess uh, scientifically we kind of use E most frequently. Anyway, uh, so that's all I like to say and looking forward to the meeting next week and hopefully we'll work more on this, over. Thank you very much, uh, Igor. And you're definitely one of the people I wanted to get feedback, but it's it's okay to revert the order. And, and I will send the slides to you and uh, the group will continue talking to you uh, afterwards uh, in, in the follow-up. Uh, thanks a lot. But okay. I, I was, thank you. I, I was going to say another person who was a mentor for the group was Angus. Angus, are you on the call? Yes, I am. Yeah. Um, I, hope, um, I hope this is coming through. First of all, uh, Congratulations to everybody involved in the project. I think, think it's really interesting and very important, uh, which I think is, is probably more relevant than the interest, quite honestly. Um, I just want to make a few, I have lots of questions about the some of the results in the ABMs about why certain things happened, why they didn't happen, but they're kind of small and I'm sure you could ask them, so it's kind of no point. Um, but uh, in these, the last few, um, presenters were saying things like how can we deal with crises that haven't happened yet and so on. Um, so uh, Rousseau was the first one really to give a sort of social response to crises after the um, Lisbon earthquake and uh, Voltaire said it's an act of God and isn't all terrible and then he said actually no most of the death is because the houses were too close together and one fell on top of each other and so they rebuilt uh, Lisbon. And uh, it's the same with COVID, right? I mean, you, you will not tell where the next um, pathogen springs up, but it's a question of how do people live together and therefore how does it spread? And as, as we've discussed in many groups, it's pretty easy to predict which groups are going to die from this. Uh, um, so when we come out with these dreadful numbers, they're actually, there's a big story underneath them. So uh, the point is that the shock itself might be impossible, but, uh, you know, we have... Uh, you know, nearly 300 years of experience of trying to work out, so how, how should we really respond? Um, I think the efficiency versus resilience trade-off, I think that might be a false trade-off. I'm not sure we're ever anywhere near an efficiency frontier. We kind of have that model in our head, but it's just the model in our head, right? You know, when was the last time we were really at the edge of the productive um, frontier? Nobody knows, nobody knows where it is, it's just the model. Um, so is that really a trade-off? Uh, is my challenge back on that? Um, one of the things that never gets raised is a policy measure, um, because I think, that, well, I'll tell you why I think it is. So human behavior, you know, perhaps our policy measures should be designed at changing how we behave. I think Elna Ostrom in her um, uh, Nobel speech said something like this at the end, that she's learned one thing, it's that policy should be, should be positioned so that it encourages people to behave in a, um, a certain way. So we got terrified with this, with the Second World War and Germany and so on. And thought, gosh, you can't really start talking about influencing people's behavior. That sounds very bad indeed and gets you into a lot of trouble. But actually, we've been doing it forever. Uh, things like the BBC, that was one of the biggest interventions to change people's behavior. It was absolutely explicit. It doesn't have to involve invading countries and things. Um, and I think that we should be a bit more open to these sort of discussions rather than thinking this is a terrible thing for a government to ever consider. Um, and finally, I was actually very impressed on the ABMs of how uh, flexible they are. And I acknowledge, uh, I think, what Thomas was saying about how difficult these are to communicate. But then when we think about, um, you know, our standard economic models in GE, when you start looking into those things properly, they're extremely complicated as well. They're no simpler. In fact, they're probably not as, um, they're probably harder than uh, an ABM to really understand. So I think perhaps some of it is just familiarity and people getting used to this um, because nobody ever asks, right, about the underlying parts of a, a DSG model now. Um, uh, so maybe that won't be quite such a big problem as people use them more. But I'll stop there, but that was really good. And um, uh, congratulations to you all.
Thank, thank you very much, Angus. And then, uh, well, more questions. I think I uh, have a hand up from Bill first, and then I'll... Yeah, I... Um, sorry, am I muted? Are you okay? I'm okay, all right, yeah. Um, I, I was frankly sort of blown away by some of this stuff. I thought it was terrific. Um, one of the things that I really welcomed was this sort of uh, philosophical or sort of epistemological approach. Um, over the course of the last 10 years or so, when you look at the sort of the G10 sort of proclamations about what is it we're trying to do here, um, you know, it started off with it was just strong growth and then it was strong, resilient growth. And then it was strong, sustainable, resilient growth. And then it was strong, resilient, stable, inclusive growth. Um, we, we have an issue here. If you don't know where you're going, you know, as the line goes, if you don't know where you're going, you're going to wind up someplace else. So thinking more about what the objectives are is really important. And as a kind of sub-theme, and I think you brought it out very, very well, is the question of when you use the words, do you know what the words mean? And the question, for example, of resilience versus efficiency, you could just as easily pose it as resilience versus stability. What precisely are meant by these things? And I'm not saying that you've got the final answers, but the, the very fact that you're raising these fundamental epistemological questions strikes me as being just like really important. The second thing that I really liked was the emphasis that you put on the limitations of your analysis both in terms of the inherent qualities of the models, you know, all of the things that you leave out, the social and economic behavioral interactions. I mean, that seems to me to be, it demonstrates an enormous degree of maturity and of understanding of what you're doing. Because what I found in my, in my long career is the people that don't really understand are the ones that don't underst understand the limitations of what they're doing. So I thought all of that stuff was really, really good. Um, but like Angus, I mean, I had some smaller questions, but they're not, they're not really all important in the big scheme of things. Like, you know, one of the questions that came to me was um, thinking about your heuristic rules. You know, um, it, does, credit get, does credit get driven? I'm thinking now again with sort of agent-based models. Does the credit that people take out um, ordinary households get driven by keeping up with the Joneses kind of behavior. Um, how does, what's the, what is the propagation mechanism that allows debt relief to show, to give better aggregate macro outcomes? Uh, I, I think these are just interesting questions, uh, but I don't need to have an answer today, just, but broadly put, um, I think this is really good stuff. Hey, thank you, Bill. And, and yes, I would encourage the group to address the answers uh, then uh, privately or on Slack or send, send more explanation to you by email and we can continue discussing that as they prepare uh, an article for, for, for the outcome of the project. Uh, and we are coming to an end. So as uh, it often happens, uh, Alan, for final words. <clears throat> well, thanks. It won't be funny, um, uh, Matthias, this will go on. But anyway, two, two very quick remarks, efficiency and resilience. The, uh, I think this is just a problem with our definition of efficiency. If we think in the longer term, then the we, resilience in some, somehow ensures that we'll be efficient and still be around in the long term. So as somebody said, somebody who was rather sort of right wing actually, he said, you know, lifeboats on a, boat, on a big ship are not efficient. He said, but somehow they could turn out to be useful. And that's exactly the situation. We're building boat, uh, boats which are a bit faster and a bit lighter, but without lifeboats. And uh, we probably need lifebo lifeboats. But uh, I just want to finish with one thing, uh, which comes out from this last discussion about ABM models and so forth. The way it always seems to have be is that people say, look, policymakers are completely converted to DSGE models. That's what they follow and that's what they believe in. And so ABM models are not in their sort of, uh, on their horizon and they don't wanna know about that. But I think that's totally untrue. I don't think policymakers are wedded to DSGE models at all. 
What they're wedded to is the guys who give them the information from those models. The policymakers don't understand DSGE models. They just hear the numbers that come out of them and they trust the guys who build those things. But I don't think they have any idea of how they work and so forth. So it's not a question of persuading them that they should stop believing in DSGE. They should stop believing in the guys who give them the G DSGE and who use them. Right. And our job should be not to tell them exactly how ABMs work and so forth, but to persuade them that the sort of information that comes out of them and the sort of thinking that goes with them is perhaps more useful than the thinking that goes with DSGE models. And it's not that they should stop believing in DSGE models. They don't believe in them. They just believe in the guys who give them the numbers. So that's my last remark. Thank, thank you, uh, uh, Alan. And I think that's a, a very good point to stop because